Hello there, and welcome to this, the first part of our discussion on the topic of linear workflows in Renderman for Maya. Now, some of you won't know what linear workflows are. That's okay. Some of you may have heard of linear workflows, but avoided them because it seemed like too much trouble. Others still may have tried to introduce them to your workflow and got things wrong and got unexpected results. Some people may use it on a daily basis and be experts with linear workflows. People who are working particularly in the film and effects industries probably have a pretty good handle on what's going on here. But I would still ask you to listen along and watch what I'm doing here because I may get something wrong and you may be able to help to clarify stuff if we get stuck along the way. So please feel free to watch through and laugh at my mistakes and tell me what I've done wrong. Okay, question number one. What is a linear workflow? One of the best places I find for a lot of resources about rendering and lighting and these kind of general issues of computer graphics is within the Pixar Renderman website. A lot of you using Renderman would actually know these resources pretty well. So one of the best resources you can actually have a look at about this subject is um, Leif Pedersen's discussion on linear workflow here in Renderman University. So let's have a look. His definition is probably as good as we're going to get. In practical terms, linear workflow refers to a rendering workflow in which image gamma is carefully taken into account in order to assure proper computations in a render. What does it mean? What it means is we actually take into account the way in which an image has its information saved at all points during the rendering process. Okay, this will become apparent as we work through things. What we're basically concerned with here is within Renderman or within most modern renderers, calculations are performed based on the presumption that the information the renderer is dealing with is linear. Particularly, we're looking um, at Renderman from Maya and it's physically plausible. Okay, so physically plausible expects the same rules in the real world to apply in the virtual world. And for a long time, this was not the case when we were saving images. Okay, that's a bit of a definition of it, but it will become clearer as we work our way through this. Okay, let's have a look where I actually discovered linear workflows first of all. And we'll come back to this page, which is the Pixar page. Well, I'll have a look, first of all, where I discovered linear workflow, where I heard about it first. Because I've been working in graphics for quite a while, and I had never heard of linear workflow. But I actually heard about it at GDC about four or five years ago. I can't remember quite when. And it was John Habel, who's a Naughty Dog technical artist or programmer, I think both in actual fact, um, gave a wonderful talk which explained a lot of what was going on. This is basically the fundamental curves of a linear workflow. The red, blue and yellow lines are nothing to do with actual colours. They're to do with the way in which an image is stored and affected within your computer. Okay, so it may make you cringe, it may make you worry, and as Leif Peterson has actually put it, have you ever seen this image and ran away? Don't be afraid of it. Please don't be afraid of it. I will do my utmost to try and explain what's going on. Okay, so this is some graphs, some mathematics. You may have bad memory of mathematics from school, or you may have loved them. I quite like them. You don't need to understand all the maths. You need to understand a couple of procedures and what is going on that makes the maths important. You don't need to understand formulae. Okay. There's a couple of numbers you may need to remember, and we'll come to those in a minute. So gamma, this again, they're um, the Naughty Dog notes from it. Uh, mostly solved in the film industry after lots of kicking and screaming. A lot of people just don't like the idea of changing their workflows, but it makes a massive, massive difference. Okay, it makes your workflow consistent 
physically plausible and reproducible. Let's have a look at this particular slide here. Okay, so you've got black and white lines. If you squint, you'll see something which is halfway between black and white. Okay, so with that in mind, if you were to take these black and white lines and squint, what would you reckon the color here would be? Considering that sRGB, our standard method of saving images, has 128 levels, sorry, 256 levels, 256 levels of grays from pure black to pure white. So screwing up your eyes, just thinking of what color is that there? And you would think that this is 128, but in actual fact, it's 187. The reason for this is that everything in sRGB is skewed in order to give more dark tones. Now this is due to a couple of things. It's due partly um, to the, the way in which our eyes perceive and also partly due to the fact that screens are not um, perfect. My apologies for the Australian advertising here. We're in the middle of an election. Um, so screens are not perfect. Pure black is not actually pure black. Pure white is a better approximation, but it's still not the, the whitest that we could possibly have. So we have to actually put more into the dark tones and less into the light tones to produce an image which is reasonable for us to understand. Okay? Hopefully that makes sense so far. Now, this is the original, this is the gamma curve which is being displayed. So in other words, where we think 127, which should be the midpoint, is actually substantially darker. Because we have more tones going in this region than we have going in this region. We have darkened things down. The midpoint is actually at 187. You can see this is 187. So what's happening here is 0 is still 0, 255 is still 255, but 128 only has a brightness level of 0.2. Now look, this is your graph, not difficult to understand. 0.2 something there and 127, 128 is there. The actual midpoint of brightness on this curve is here, which is about 187. So that's what this curve is doing. Does that make sense to people? I hope so. Okay, so in the real world, a brightness of 128 will occur at 0.5. In an alpha world for sRGB, that 50% brightness occurs up here because we have more dark tones. Let's see more dark tones here before we get to the lighter tones and then fewer at the very end. Does that make sense to people? Please let me know if it does or not. Okay, so there are a couple of things we need to consider with this. These are just some images here. Okay. When we take a picture of the real world, it's gamma corrected, so it displays properly in the virtual world. When we perform calculations on it in a rendering package, we should correct this gamma. We should put this gamma back to being linear because the mathematics for rendering works best or works at all when it's real world linear space so in other words the midpoint is the midpoint the midpoint is not over here okay so we need to use the yellow curve to compensate for the red curve to get us back to the blue curve okay the blue curve is what we need to actually have inside our rendering package now let's have a look so the gamma values, generally 2.2 and 0.454. So 2.2 is the gamma that we actually have for images and 0.454 is the reverse gamma. Okay, let's have a look, just skip through those and we'll come into this in more detail in a little bit. Question which some people will ask, why not just store your image with a linear um, color curve to it. 
Well, we can do. In EXR or in HDR images, there is more of a linear curve to things. But in general, our eyes perceive more detail in black areas than in very white areas. So if we were to actually have a display which was linear, you can see what's happening here. Let's just go to the next slide. I think you'll see it better. Where are the numbers here? Let me see if I can find them. OK, let's go back to here. Um, the dark values have very, very few numbers to actually map to. OK, so this would be linear. And this is sRGB. OK, let's click through these. It may actually more, make more sense to have a look at John Hable's other website, which is Filmic Games. Let me see here. Let's see. The same slides are here. OK, let's just refer to this slide again. We can see we have a greater concentration of dark tones. This allows us to actually get information which we see. OK, so we need to correct this. We need to work with a workflow which gets things back into Maya and Renderman working correctly. The best way which we can do this, let's have a look at the Pixar site again. This is where it gets really, really good. Okay. We have an input, which if it's sRGB, will need to be corrected. The calculations happen entirely in linear space, and the output needs to be corrected again from linear space back to sRGB, so we can actually see it correctly with our um, video monitors. OK. So in other words, there are several points within a workflow where things need to be done. With the input, anything that's an sRGB image needs to be linearized. That's an image needs to be linearized. Also, the color swatches within Maya need to be linearized because they're not, by definition, linear to start with. So there's a way of doing that. We'll have a look at this in a while. The calculations are done linearly. And in general, we will output linear because it's easier to actually composite with. And again, mathematics, so that works better. But when we put it to screen, we need to actually change the lookup table and put it back to being sRGB. So it means we have to correct it back to the 2.2 gamma. OK. Now, hopefully this has made a certain amount of sense to you. It will make more sense as we work through some more tutorials. And the next tutorial will actually be working slightly backwards. We'll be looking at displaying the information first and working back to converting information for use within rendering. Now, the reason for this is if we don't work backwards, what we're seeing will be incorrect all the way through. So we'll be doing the correction at the end first and the first last. Hopefully that's not too confusing. If you find this massively confusing, I'd suggest reading through Linear Workflow in Renderman uh, University here, having a look at Filmic Games, which is uh, John Hable's website, which has a lot of information about it and which you may find jogs your mind to actually understand it. I've been looking at it for quite a while, for, like I say, about four years. It is confusing to start with. You need to actually apply practical examples to make it sensible to yourself. OK, the important thing to remember is sRGB and color swatches within Maya images, which are being input, have no correction in them and need to be corrected to become useful for use in rendering. EXR images do not need it. And images which are used as numerical values, in other words, things like um, normal maps, which refer to vectors, we don't need to actually correct those. So we'll have a look at where and when we use it, but I'll be working backwards. So let's just stop here for the moment and I'll put this up. Hopefully it's been of some use to you. We'll get into Maya and Renderman and how we display and output images first. Then we'll go back to how we actually input images correctly. Okay, thank you for your time. Hope I haven't confused you. Let's just see how this has gone.